Welcome to the 21st announcement of the 21st AKO Kane Prize for African Writing. From Aesop's Fables, the Ifa Chronicles, the Song of Lawino, to Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart, Ngugi's Devil on a Cross, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's Half of a Yellow Sun, and a plethora of new names, from Aisha Haruna Atta to No Violet Bulawayo to Jennifer Makumbi. Africa has always shared its wealth of stories with the world. And for the past 20 years, the AKO Kane Prize for African Writing has celebrated this writing from the continent and her diaspora, bringing us some of the most beguiling writers of the 20th century with stories as varied as the places they come from. The prize itself is part of Africa's 20th century story, founded five years after South Africa's first democratic elections and one year after Nigeria's return to democracy. Born amidst a wave of sweeping global and African struggles for freedom of expression and equal rights, the AKO Kane Prize for African Writing is very much part of the story of a new, confident Africa, proud of its past, yet also strongly invested in crafting for itself a beautiful future. The winners and writers shortlisted for the prize are a who's who of Africa's literary renaissance, and among its patrons, founders and alumni are the giants of Africa's modern literary experience. The 2020 nominees are Erika Sugo Anyadike for How to Marry an African President, Chikodili Emalumadu for What to Do When Your Child Brings Home a Mami Wata, Johor Ile for Fisherman Stew, Remy Gamiche for The Neighborhood Watch, Irenason Okojie for Grace Jones from Nudie Branch. Like every seemingly young plant, though, its roots run deep drawing on the legacy of the African Writers' Series and the Noma Award for African Literature, as well as the legacy of the first generation of African writers' advocacy and publishing. The prize came about after the difficult economic and social upheavals of the 1980s and 1990s, which saw Africa's vibrant, nascent publishing industries struggle under the pressure of economic stress, shrinking democratic space, and massive migration. African writers still wrote, but for a long time, it seemed many beyond the continent were not paying attention. The success of previous winners and shortlisted writers and the continued commitment of its supporters and funders is testament to the fact that it takes a village to raise a prize and that many hands make light work. The AKO Kane Prize was built on these foundations a small group of people with the unstinting support of the great and good within Africa, Africa's diaspora, and Africanists, came together to launch what has become a catalyst for some of the most dynamic writing and literary activity in the world. Each year, to celebrate the shortlisted writers and announce the winner, the prize holds a series of events and a dinner with the great and good of African writing for the 20th time on May 19th, 2020, despite a global pandemic that seemed to threaten the very existence of humanity, a small, everyday miracle happened. The five shortlisted writers were announced as the 20th shortlisted writers of the Kane Prize for African Writing, for five stories that speak brilliantly to the human condition and to what it is to be a person of African descent at the start of the 21st century. So, this year, though they are holding the canapes, the shortlisted writers are still being celebrated. Join us in learning who the 21st winner of the prize will be, right here. The AKO Kane Prize was founded 20 years ago in memory of Sir Michael Kane, who had spent a great deal of his life working on the African continent and his friends and family wanted a way to um, commemorate this devotion and this relationship he'd had. From the beginning, the prize was about celebrating the voices of writers from Africa and her diaspora. 
And it's very interesting to see that in, in the intervening time, more prizes have risen up to, um, to do the same thing. And we are in very good company with other prizes. But at the same time, I feel very confident in saying that we've helped change the literary landscape and helped bring African writers to a much wider audience. I'm very proud of all of the 20 winners of the AKO Kane Prize. Now, how do you whittle down 131 submissions from 21 countries to just five behind me and eventually the winner? When we started this process as judges, there were a few fundamental uh, questions we were holding up uh, uh, to answer in, in how we selected the stories. We were looking for stories that were really original uh, you know, and striking in their own way, and and, and you know, stories. What what would people? What do people most need to read, and why? And one of the things I think we need to remember is that <laughs> when we started this process, this was pre-COVID. Um, it was pre-lockdown, <laughs> and it was pre the whole Black Lives Matters movement. And I suppose <laughs> throughout this process of reading and selecting the stories. These things have, I suppose, created a, an incredibly important context in which to consider what kind of story needs telling. But also not just what kind of story needs telling, but who's telling it. I think that it's crucial because for decades, if not you know, you know, hundreds of years, the story has been told through a colonial lens. And it's so important now that, that you know, we have Africans telling the story of Africa and the diaspora. Um, and telling it in many in multi-dimensional ways but that, that really capture the incredible breadth and diversity of, it, of, of, the, of that experience. And I think that is so important now that when that, 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 you know, Africans own their own narrative. Um, and, and also, it's, you know, we're not just talking about history, we're talking about the present. Um, and we're also talking about the future. And in some of the stories we presented with, you know, the, an Afrofuturistic story that manages to capture um, a future in which the idea of slavery and colonialism do not even exist as thoughts or questions. Um, that's in, that was extraordinary to come across in, 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 in some of the stories that we read. Um, and so I think it really is about changing the whole perspective and looking with a new lens at what has happened uh, what is happening right now and what may happen in the future. And it's about giving ownership to Africans of their own story. They join a cohort of 100 other writers shortlisted for the world's leading award for African writing. Their stories are innovative, highly crafted tales with strong contemporary resonance. From a story that tackles what to do when your child marries a spirit, to a guide on how to marry an African president. These stories are brilliant, wickedly funny in places, and beautifully and heartbreakingly original. Let's find out a little bit more about these authors and their stories, shall we? Watch Army Tanks roll in an inexorable march towards the presidential residence. Hear the onerous clank, the metallic tread on tarmac, and realize that this is the soundtrack to your demise. Smell the tear gas in the air, the scent burning your nostrils, pinpricks of moisture scalding your eyes. It will be a hot day, but you will shiver, your blood congealing in your veins. Your husband will assure you it is all for show. He is the head of the armed forces. They listen to him. Doubt him for the first time. You know how the army veterans hate you. You've heard the talk. Him they can forgive. They know his history, his credentials, but you'll be reduced to that thing between your legs, your only power that of a young woman to turn an old man's head. Chafe at this. It has always irked you, but that is of no consequence now. Attempt to rally your supporters. Arm a few members of the security forces still loyal to the president. Consider that people may do many things for money, but they are far more circumspect about being required to lose their lives. The genre that I chose to write in is a genre called biofiction. As a fiction writer, I'm not so interested in the what, I'm interested more in the how and the why. So I started to think about certain questions. I started to think about how does a woman decide to marry a man 40 years her senior? I started to think about how does she deal with the consequences of that choice? Why is she so reviled? 
And some of the things that were interesting to me were the parallels that I began to draw between the biblical women Eve and Delilah and Grace Mugabe. I also started to think about Icarus and ambition and flying too close to the sun. And I realized how to marry an African president was an excellent Trojan horse, a vehicle in which to smuggle some of those themes and explore some of those ideas. What to do when your child brings home a mummy water? Please note, mummy water, also known in various other regions as mummy water, is used in this context as an umbrella term for both genders of the popular water entity, i.e. mummy and papi waters, and does not represent those other mere creatures without the appearance of absolute humanoid traits. For these other non-humanistic water entities, including, but not restricted to, permanent mermaids and mermen, crocodile fellows, shark brides, turtle crones, and anomalous jelly blobs of indeterminate orientation, please see our companion volume. I wrote my story as a how-to guide because quite frankly, I was just jealous of people who are in academia. It's where I've always wanted to end up and I didn't think that my interests were suited to academia. And so I wrote a paper in that format because I just want to be included. I don't like being left out, that's all it is. And um, I think for me, it was getting back into the mindset of uh, being in school and writing to a certain kind of format that was the challenge in there. Um, because, you know, there were things like, you know, making sure that the footnotes sounded genuine. They sounded like actual papers that people could write and had been written and existed somewhere out there. You know, because the idea for me um, behind the story of uh, what to do when your child brings home a mummy water is a big online resource. So whereby the story itself stands, but every single footnote is an actual paper that leads you on to somewhere else, sort of like a cobweb. Um, and the challenge was making it sound, making it convey my message, you know, and also retain its humor, but have that kind of set structure that one would not normally associate with humor and, you know, things like, things of that nature, or like with the supernatural. Sunday, Avis, Kleinventuk, and Eros. Sundays are the best days. Eros and Klein Vintuk have the highest walls. Dogs safely pen behind fences, bins lined up on the pavement, and, most importantly, people who recycle. The paper, cardboard, plastic boxes, tin cans, and aluminum foil are sorted into separate plastic bags. Some people even wash the trash before they throw it away. Everything else that is of no use goes in the big green bins which is a much more efficient way to forage. It saves time, mitigates disappointment. Those suburbs are also close to headquarters, so the neighborhood watch does not have to stray too far from their home. The neighborhood watch follows a group of five people trying to make a life for themselves on Winter City streets. The easiest way to have conducted research for this to make sure that the story was believable, make sure that it made sense was knowing Vintuk myself. So the first step of research was driving around and familiarizing myself with the geography of the city. Because even for a small place, sometimes things aren't where you expect them to be. So some of the suburbs, they, they blur, and you're not sure where one starts and where one begins. And the characters of each suburb change, changes considerably, depending on where you are and who you are and how well you know the place. So that was the first thing. The second was I needed to make sure that the plot driver of the story, the rubbish collection dates uh, were correct. And that I made sure it was correct by having a municipal bill that shows on which days, which suburbs have their rubbish collected. The third most important thing was just getting into the characters' heads, trying to imagine what life in those communities or for that demographic of people could be like. Observation is probably the most important tool that a writer has at their disposal. And so observing the way these people conduct themselves, how they move through the world, who they avoid, how other people treat them was quite important. 
Now, I am not homeless myself and I have not spent life on the streets. And I cannot, for example, say that my depiction of their struggles is the most authentic. I'm sure other writers have done, have done similar things and they've probably done it better. But how I was able to get into their characters, uh, try and, you know, internalize their needs, was to put myself in their opposite situation. As someone who is not homeless, you take your daily routine and then you contrast it with whatever the extreme might be. I was also kind of helped in this writing process by having known a couple of homeless people when I was living in Cape Town in South Africa and where I live here in Vintuk in Namibia. There are quite a few homeless people around. Um, and so just being able to observe them, uh, interacting with them, having conversations with them, because these are ordinary people. Uh, they're always willing to talk to you if you talk to them. Out on the main road, Nimi turned towards the market. It was that time just before nightfall, when people were on their way home from work, when the air darkened and the figures milling in the market and the streets may not be people at all. Her eye caught an ice cream man peddling home on his bicycle. He was done for the day. No bell ringing, no driving the children mad with want. She felt awake to her own footfalls, to the bright green and yellow head scarf on the woman walking ahead, to the rising murmur of the market as she approached, and to the cars tooting their horns, picking along in the rush hour traffic. She weaved her way through the crowd, sidestepped puddles, stared clear of the man pushing a wheelbarrow loaded with sacks of onions and grunting chants, chants. The stalls at the very end of the market were the ones she wanted. The protagonist in Fisherman's Stew is a woman, an older woman. Um, how difficult was it for me to find her voice? Um, the answer to that would be not difficult at all. Um, and I didn't have to do any particular research to find that voice. Um, maybe I've just been researching for a long time. I think some stories are given to you. This one came, I wrote it you know, in under two sittings. And um, I think I've just been paying attention for a long time. And that made this voice easy to write. I've been listening to the stories around me. and. Um, when I had to write this story, the research I did was for other things. Uh, how to, just to make sure that the recipe for Fisherman's Stew was correct. You know, that was the only research I did. There was a building that remained a husk, a blackened charcoal carcass gutted from the inside out. The carcass leaned against the heavens in protest at its losses, at its snatched internal sky, tainted with the fingerprints of one last daily procession, rituals of the living. And while the world slept, awoke, the cities hummed with chaos and order, rivers began in cotton pockets, copping slackened fists, the waters undulated into lost reflections, the gods got high off the colours from the seas, the equator adjusted itself only slightly, the stars twinkled in haphazard collusion. The mountains dappled by hammer tan winds that became personal directions. The building remains. An artificial gut bathed in degrees of light, lodged in the stages of a day. The building was a hollow within a carcass, within a husk, within a world, within a galaxy. Uh, I'm really trying to push the boundaries in terms of language, form and ideas, um, because I find that I really enjoy um, being in the writing space when I'm doing that. Um, as far as I'm concerned, you know, what are you, you know, adding um, in terms of what you're doing with your literature, if you're just doing the same old, same old. So I really want to make the space exciting for me. I want to come to the page, um, raring to go and wanting to know what's going to happen to these characters, how they're going to develop, and also surprise myself in the process. So I think because I have that at a fundamental level, intrinsic within my writing practice, within my process, 
to challenge myself, then ultimately that means the readers um, are surprised and that the work is provocative. And that is absolutely deliberate. Um, I do want to write provocative work uh, because I think only then can we really challenge ourselves in terms of how we how we look at the human condition and how we, you know, we empathise with people um, in certain contexts and how we particularly empathise um, with, with people on the fringes who may not you know, necessarily often be centred. So um, what I'm really passionate about is centering, um, you know, characters on the fringes and really um, exploring their internal um, uh, and external lives. I don't know about you, but if this year's stories are anything to go by, the continued vitality of the African literary scene seems assured with so much brilliant work coming from the continent and her diaspora. All the stories are available to read on the Prize's website. And in this book, published by the Prize, with partners across Africa and the rest of the world, to ensure the stories get to as wide an audience as possible. So, you might ask, 20 or so years since the Prize was founded, African writers are more recognised, there are more African literary magazines and publishers, and a voracious readership in Africa and abroad. Do we still need an African prize for short stories? Our challenge going forward is going to be to continue to remain relevant. We are a British prize celebrating the African continent, and we have to acknowledge that we do something a little bit different from our sister prizes who are on the continent. But I think we will continue to work together and to expand our activities. The most important thing is providing support for writers and giving readers wonderful stories. So, the story is just beginning. 2020 has been a momentous year for the prize. This is the year in which, along with our steadfast donors who've been with us from the very beginning, we managed to secure funding from the AKO Foundation. This has made a huge difference. With their commitment, it means that we can go ahead and plan for the future which means carrying on with our existing programs and our workshops, but also starting some new initiatives. I've long been concerned about the need for editorial support for writers living on the continent. Some of them live in countries where there is a good um, literary industry and some of them don't. And so very soon we'll be um, announcing an initiative about to help with editing, which will be done online. And certainly with the COVID global pandemic, being online is something that we're all having to learn about. And I have to say that our team has really risen to the challenge and I'm grateful to all of our authors who have agreed to, to help us as we do our events online. So 20th anniversary year, rather brilliant, I'm happy. To paraphrase Ben Okri, one of the long-standing supporters of the prize, African writers will always have much to say with stories out of the vigorous, pullulating, rowdy, rich, and strange conditions of the continent. Tales political, tales harrowing, tales humorous, tales told with vitality and passion and intelligence. No doubt, the existence of the AKO Kane Prize and the lure of publication has given courage to hundreds of writers who otherwise might not have known where to send their stories about the lives they were living or imagining. Nevertheless, wrenchingly beautiful though all this year's stories are, there can, alas, be only one winner. And this year... It has been an immense honour and privilege to serve as Chair of the Judging Panel for this year's Kane Prize. And I would like to begin by thanking my fellow judges, Audrey, Ibise, James and Gabriel, for their invaluable support, wisdom, insight, humour, and their passionate and wholehearted engagement throughout this process. The story of Africa is not one story. How could it ever be? The story of Africa is many stories, as rich and varied as that vast and beautiful continent and her extensive diaspora. And one of the things we really valued as judges about our role was the extraordinary diversity across the many narratives we were presented with. And as such, it gave us not only a hugely rich experience for which we were all grateful, but also an intellectual and indeed quite an emotional challenge in choosing our top five short stories. 
As judges, we'd like to thank and congratulate all the writers who submitted their stories for consideration in this year's prize. I'm very pleased to say that that same breadth and diversity of imagination is also represented in the final five shortlisted stories. Each of the authors has brought to the reader something which in its own right is worthy representation of African writing at its very best. Each with a dazzling display of talent and exploration of form, style, plot and voice. And collectively, these stories show us that African writing is in robust health. And so again, on behalf of my fellow judges, I would like to thank and congratulate those authors whose works were selected for the top five shortlisted stories. However, there can only be one overall winner and our job as judges was in the end to select one story and one writer from this amazing shortlist to be the recipient of this year's Kane Prize. In choosing the best short story, we were looking as judges for a number of key things. We were looking for a story that has real lasting power, that the kind of story that stays with you long after the last page has been turned. We were looking for a story that adds a new dimension to the bigger narrative of Africa and her extensive diaspora, that has the power to change perceptions or shed light on new perspectives perhaps by bringing to the foreground voices that are frequently underrepresented. Above all, we're looking for writing that is superbly crafted with a great story at its heart. And our winning story, I'm pleased to say, has all those vital ingredients in abundance. This year's winner of the AKO Kane Prize for African writing is a radical story that plays with logic, time and place. It defies convention as it unfolds a narrative that is both multi-layered and multi-dimensional. It is risky, dazzling, imaginative and bold. It is intense and full of stunning prose. It's also a story that reflects African consciousness in the way it so seamlessly shifts dimensions. And it is a story that demonstrates extraordinary imagination most of all, it is world-class writing by an African writer. In writing this, this story, the author has taken on a challenging subject matter. It is a profound exposition on grief and loss, on the complexity of trauma, and on the struggle to forgive ourselves whilst facing the reality of living on as a survivor. At the heart of this story, is its main protagonist, a young woman from Martinique living in London, who is moonlighting as a celebrity impersonator. Her journey moves exquisitely and seamlessly between the exploration of the universal experiences of unspeakable suffering, pleasure and escape, and the particular experience of being black and African in a global city such as London. In the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement, which has prompted deeply powerful questions about race, justice, and equality in the world today, this story offers a salient exploration of what it can mean to embody and perform blackness in the world. This is a story of tremendously delicate power and beauty, and one in which we recognize the tradition of African storytelling and imagination at its finest. I'm delighted to announce that the winner of this year's AKO Ken Prize for African Writing is Grace Jones by Irenison Okodje. It's really, really phenomenal. It's not something that I expected at all because I always thought that my writing was a little bit too weird for something like the Kane Prize. But I think that this is wonderful because it means that my work gets introduced to an African audience as well as an international audience. It, I think African countries can know a bit more about my work because I don't think that that's happened so much for me because obviously I've been published here and you know my books have been distributed in the US but not really in Africa. So this is wonderful. This is a great acknowledgement. I you know, and I'm chuffed to bits. Thank you for joining us for the 2020 AKO Kane Prize.
Bye. 